stock car challenge. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Daytona International Speedway for the e-virtual stock car challenge. We've got ourselves three class types here today. We have the tour modified, the late models, and the street stocks. And alongside me in the booth here today, we've got ourselves, guys, he's at some point driven pretty much all of these cars. Mr. Brad Sanford, Mr. Joel Johnson, and Mr. John Pozak. Good evening. Good evening. Well, good evening, everybody. Hey, what's up, Will? How are you guys doing tonight? Good evening, guys. And, Brandon, I'll come to you first. I know you guys um, drive the, the modifieds. Um, this car's changed recently, uh, well, in the last week or so, you know, with new tire model, um, big changes to the car and the way it handles. But these cars on a road course, you know, it is difficult to control, especially when you have to turn right as well as left. That's right, Will. These cars are set up to usually only turn left. Uh, in the real world, they will run at Lime Rock Park uh, once a season, but usually the cars require a major rebuild before that can happen. Uh, we don't have that luxury here in iRacing, so the setups you have to build for these tour mods with the new tire model really are a challenge. So it'll be interesting to see how well some of these guys who are running the tour mods tonight have adapted their setups to this uh, right turn road course. And of course, we expect the um, Tour Mod to probably be the fastest car here today. In fact, it was um, the Tour Mod applied to Leah Wilson, who set the fastest time by four seconds over Michelle Asini in the practice session that was held just before qualifying, which is seeing occurring now. Um, but the late models, again, they're one of the cars, they are very difficult. You know, to slow down into these corners and get around the cars. They're a lot more nimble in some ways, you know, than the higher up NASCAR series cars, but still you've got to be very careful and you really can't overshoot these cars into the corners. Yeah, well, and I think that's kind of half the challenge that they're looking for today here at the 45 minutes of Daytona uh, with the three different cars. And all three cars were set up mostly for, for oval tracks. So it becomes an extreme challenge, not only in the driving, but the setup capabilities of the crew chiefs um, to get these cars uh, onto this track and turning left and right in, in the braking zones and all kinds of things that most of these drivers are not used to dealing with during the course of a race. And the street stocks, there's only two of them in this race today. That is that of Michael Denton and Kevin Lindberg. Now these cars are the slowest on the, they are going to be the slowest on the track, about 16, 17 seconds off the racing pace, but so we have seen many races before, you know, we, you and I, we've commentated on the many multi-class races. And one of the good things about um, Daytona is that the track is long. So therefore, lapped cars doesn't become a big factor. And you've got that big section of the banking to, you know, pass lap tra traffic if you need to. Yeah, as far as that's concerned, the way the track layout, it definitely favors because of the big, long, sweeping oval where they get on get on the front stretch they go all the way around turn one and turn two and they come back around onto the on the back stretch so that favors the tour mod which is running almost double the horsepower and half the weight that you see on the street stock or on the late model so that definitely that piece of the track favors um the tour mod now you would think that the infield part of the track where all the corners are is going to favor uh the the heavier cars but that probably is not going to be the case tonight um, and I think the only thing you really have to worry about is the open wheel car versus the fender car where the open wheel car is considerably uh, easier to damage. Although one of the key things with the um, tour modified car is the fact that that thing's only got two gears on it so you know you'd have the one car for pretty much the, inf the one gear for the infield the one gear for the outfield almost then that's going to make things, you know, slow that car down because you, you're going to set your gear for the longest straight line speed. But then in the infield section, you're almost, you know, having to compensate all the way around. That's a really good point, Will. I was out here practicing this car earlier, and uh, just to keep the car from hitting the rev limiter on the bank portion of the track, you really do have to run a longer gear. 
And the fact that you only have two gears to choose from in this tour mod really does hurt your ability to accelerate out of the corners on the infield portion of this track. Yeah, but does, doesn't, though, John, when you're looking at the tour mod, even though you have to extend that second gear, uh, I think that, you're gonna, that we're going to find that the other two cars are just don't have the top speed or the ability to get there. So even with that, I think the tour mod's definitely favored on the uh, uh, oval part of the track. Well, or would you say that there's, that there's something that's equalizing this? I, I'm trying to find something that's equalizing these cars in this particular track configuration. I would say definitely in the oval track, um, on the oval section of the race track, yeah. But it all comes down to the torque that you get for the corners. And don't forget, you can use the way that you, know, you lose the gears as an additional method of helping to turn that car, as many drivers do on, for example, the NASCAR circuit, that you can use that car, those gears to help turn the car um, into the corners. You can do the same with the road course. So um, having those extra gears available could come in handy, especially, I'd say, more for the late model car. Um, but it's going to be interesting. I think that the tour mods might run away at the start, but you've still got to be careful. You know, one little mistake on the infield, um, especially with these long gravel traps, they you're going to get caught up by the late models, and if they get stuck in traffic, it's going to be very difficult for them to make their way to the field. Personally, I think the, the late models are one of the more underrated road cars in the service, so I wouldn't be surprised to see them hold pace, at least, especially through the infield uh, section early on in the race. Yeah, I well, totally I agree with John, Brad, you can talk. No, 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 I was just going to say... Andy. Oh, you're good, man. I totally agree with John and what you were saying earlier, Will, that I even though the Tour Mod has the higher top speed and can fly around the uh, bank portion of the course today, I think the winner is actually going to be who can make the least amount of mistakes, keep their car on course, hit their marks, and bring the car home in one piece if at all possible. Yeah, and I think you're seeing it out here in the qualifying, because right now you've only got five people that were, have been successfully been able to navigate the track and put down a, a qual lap, and I think for the Tour Modified, I think it might be a matter of not trying to go too fast, because we're, we're seeing a lot of people having trouble keeping that car uh, nailed down on the track. And then there's a very select group of drivers we're going to see here today. It's going to be very interesting, you know, these cars, not many on the racetrack, it's going to be a case of virtually a driver's mind over matter. You're not going to necessarily see um, too much overtaking, but... Um, you know, pit stops could come into a factor, tyres could definitely come into a factor, um, especially on this um, Tour Modified cars now, they are very prone to heating their tyres up after a period of time, and it could get to a point that you'd rather come down pit road and, you know, get yourself some um, fresh tyres and come back out, rather than having to struggle with, you know, a set of tyres that's going to be slipping and sliding around the infield, so that could play into um, some drivers' hands later on. Yeah, well, it really could. Uh, John, what do you think about that with this new update with the uh, new tire model on the modified? Uh, temperatures really haven't seemed to be an issue, and the car has a lot more grip now. So, I mean, it, someone could come up with the perfect setup, you know, and act like a cowboy and ride that horse all the way to the finish line. Well, I can tell you that uh, from what we've seen so far, just in the, the one week we've had of experience on this new tire with the Tour Modified, the tire wear over a long run really is not that consequential. So I wouldn't be surprised to see some of these guys in the Tour Mod try to really extend their runs and uh, maybe pick up a little bit of advantage in doing so. Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. I think... Uh I've noticed personally with testing with this new tire model and the modified, the uh, temperatures seem to uh, not be as effective. The car has so much more grip. This, if someone could come up with a great setup, they could actually be able to navigate the bottom half of the course and the infield and uh, use that to their advantage. And of course, our resident cowboy, um, Sanford, will be down on a pit road for Nuts Race. We'll be keeping an eye out, making sure that these drivers, if they do come down pit road, he will let you know exactly what is going on with that. Um, Looks as though we've got ourselves about a minute left of qualifying. Um, Leah Wilson is still leading the way with a time of 1 minute 51.868 in the Tour Modified machine, number 98 machine. Christopher Mark is in second with a time of 1 minute 56.304 at the moment. That is in the 09 late model. And then Mushi Wassini in the number 99 machine is currently sat in the third position. Um, and we will just wait for this well, about half a minute and we'll give you your final grid for this race. 
but it's going to be an interesting race. Um, it looks like some good drivers on this track as well. Um, I think once this race gets settled down, it will be really interesting to see how the um, late models can respond to the additional um, speed advantage, especially in the banking, that the tour mods present. That's true, Will. Uh, I'm wondering if some of these late models might be able to cowboy up and sort of run a draft on the outer portion of this racetrack and try to neg uh, negate some of the advantage the tour mods might have. That looks like we're finishing up our qualifying now. We've got uh, 16 cars uh, uh, actually showing up with still only five cars uh, completing a complete lap. On looks like they're gridding up right now, so going to be interesting. So we're going to run through your grid then. This might change, but we'll keep it as it is for now. Um, Leo Wilson will um, lead the field through the green flag on the inside of row number one in the number 98 machine. With that time, a 1 minute 51.868. In the second position, Matthew Katana with a time of 1 minute 58.553. The rest of your um, field in the modifiers will be Mike King, Chris Cable, Chad Ross, Joe Mullinuk, Fred Le Pella and um, had Le Mountain. and then in the um, late models it's going to be Christopher Mark from Michi Rossini and then Gary um, Mitch Blauber and Brendan Burkhoff and Eric Wood just two cars on the street stop and as we mentioned earlier that is Michael Denton and Kevin Lemberg and as always everybody the names of the drivers actually have been changed to protect the innocent. So you just see that the pace car is can't sat at the start finish line. He'll lead the field round. We say it's a he. It's always seems to be a he when it comes to the pace car, leading the field round for one lap of the circuit, and then we're going to get ourselves underway. And this first lap, you know, it's going to be a big, big breaking zone down into turn number one, and. Guys, it is always so slippery down there, and it's so easy to make a mistake under braking, especially the way that car, that turn just feeds directly into turn number two, um, with that imposing exit wall just looming, ready to catch out drivers. Looks like we lost uh, Matthew Kitan uh, uh, in P2, did not grid, did not make the grid. So obviously issues of looking that car there on the way up to the green flag we'll try and get a handle on what the issue was there for um, the number three Cobb Carolina driver however you see that this car is leading the field now through turn number one and two notice those tire barriers and so many times in this racetrack you've seen drivers you know get a little bit loose in turn number one try and correct it and then just spear themselves into that tire barrier and now the field coming down into turn number five, the International Horseshoe. In fact, that's the only one that actually has a track name back right? before they'll flick it to the left for turn number six, before that long double apex right-hander for turn seven. And, Will, I just wanted to give you confirmation on Matthew Catani. It seems that he had suspension issues with tie rods could not get his car repaired and will be unable to race this evening. So his race is done before it even begins. Big disappointment for that Club Carolina driver. Um, however, the pace car now coming down into that left-hander for turn number eight. This is where the cars will get their first taste of the banking. You've got to be very careful, though, as you get onto the banking in some of these cars because it, it does like to snap a little bit loose as you hit about 31 degrees of banking on the oval. This is in between turn number one and two of the Toyota International Speedway's oval course. And you'll see a lot of passing happening here. And one of the key things is the driver's going to have to not anticipate what the driver behind is going to do and always just race their own racing line. Yeah, that turn right there has always been rather tricky for in any car. You see a lot of that... Uh, people getting on the throttle a little too soon and getting loose and spinning out there. And, of course, you will see exactly that. You'll see a lot of people overtaking right there as they enter, enter the oval section. So we'll be looking for that as uh, this progresses. And then you come down into the bus stop chicane. This is where, you know, a driver could sneak up like a cowboy and come down the inside 
into that left, right, right, left flick. And you can use the curbs quite a lot on entry here, but you've got to be very careful on the exit just to make sure you don't cut too much of that curb, otherwise you wouldn't cut yourself a slow down penalty, which when you consider the fact that the straightaway then pretty much goes all the way down past turn three and four of the banking through past the start finish line, not what you're going to want to have to see. You see the pace car there now working its way through the final corner of this beautiful, beautiful racetrack. As they'll come off of the banking, we'll see the pace car make that turn down towards pit lane again. The field is bunching up nicely now for the start of this race. And we'd like to welcome you all. We'll be here on Glacier TV for the entirety of this race now. And... In fact, there you see the pace car will start making that journey down towards pit road now. And as he'll do so, it'll be Leo Wilson on the inside of row number one. Rashid Rossini on the outside of row number one with just one more of the late models behind them. And they'll come down too wide now. And they will get themselves the green flag here at Daytona International Speedway. Yeah, Great looks start like by the two of spots. Yeah, they shot right out ahead. And it'll be three wide in turn one. And he's still always oh. collecting each other there. That was the battle for the second and the third position. And it was so close between them. They're still too wide as they're going to turn them three and four for the first time. Down towards the international horsey. Oh. And that's, that's a late model there. And there was at least two cars involved in that. Oh, yeah. Definitely uh, mowing the grass there. Slow it down, guys. Got to get you the first lap. And you see one of the tour modifiers had an issue there. I'm having a look at the blimp cam. It looks as though that was the number... Four, I think I'm mistaken, on Mike King going very, very slowly letting all of the late models go past him. So he's obviously had some damage early on in this race. And I'm not quite sure what happened to him there because he didn't actually collect anyone. He's just looking as though he's dropped to the rear of this field. Yeah, it definitely does appear that way. And it seems like we have a great battle starting to go on up front between the 98 and the 05. Yeah, I mean, while I'm banking for the first time, Leo Wilson is in the way still in this race, but the 0-5 machine of Chris Cable will be able to use good effect of this draft there down into the bus stop chicane for the first time. That left-right flick will be the first bit. got a break here at about 150 meters. You see just how close Cable gets close to them there. And as they come out, you want to get yourself good momentum because you can build up the speed all the way through this bank portion of the racetrack down past the start finish line. And if you're going to overtake, the best place to do it, guys, is on this section of the racetrack, lining them up to get them at the start, finish, breeze around the outside into turn number one. Yeah, it looks like you got a, got a little bit of overtaking going on there. It's, it's kind of funny to see some of the, uh, the street stocks and the late models running up here like, like you were talking about uh, uh, in that banking section. The tour modified is definitely the king and you see there that's very close now for the race lead and the 05 was chris cable was literally about two car lengths behind coming down into turn number one so i think if cable can keep that momentum up from the infield section of this racetrack you can have a, a, a slight move down into the chicane or you can gather that momentum up a little bit more and then use that on the latter stages of this racetrack but those two modifiers are doing a great job out front and um, showing you a little bit about the speed difference, they've pulled out a four and a half second gap to the, their nearest rival, and that is Chris Ross in the number 38 machine. Well, you know, something else, too, to keep your eye on is we've got uh, Christopher Mark in the 09 car up until just when he went off the track right there, was doing a great job of keeping up with the two tour modifieds in front of him. So uh, I thought that was quite, quite an impressive display of driving right there. And guys, this modified car is a handful and a half, though, so some good driver talent involved there. She has to keep it on the racetrack, and this is going to be the battle for the race lead. Coming down into the bus stop chicane, Cable looking down to the inside, but not going to be quite enough, just getting off the throttle a little bit. So then try and make the momentum work for him out of the chicane, but that time, it just didn't look as though he got it. Yeah, well, I think if somebody's going to make a pass, that's a likely place with these tour modifieds. Uh, you wouldn't think it to look at them, but they really do get a strong draft up on that bank portion of the racetrack, and you can see the effects there. 
So on and off the banking once again there to put a second lap in the books. Let's not forget this is a timed race. 45 minutes a lap. They don't count for much. Although, lately on this race, you know, these drivers could be hoping that they will set their fuel number as close as possible to the limit. And they're going to be really upset if they have to do one extra lap. As we've often seen in these timed races, it can always go either way on, you know, whether or not they have to do the extra lap or not. And that's Chris Cable there off the racetrack. This is down in turn number five, just keeping it out of the wall. But he's now going to possibly lose a position there to Mike King as he'll come out onto the racetrack. And you see that both modifieds there spinning ahead of the 38. Oh. And, Ross, and the number four car of Mike King will get past. But Chad Ross there just tried to seize the advantage. Didn't quite work out for him. Yeah, now you've got a great one going on for the third and fourth position, or actually second and third position, but that leaves uh, Larry Wilson out front uh, all by the lonesome there to increase that gap. Yeah, Wilson has now stretched um, out a serve. Well, with seven attempts at the line, it's now up to almost about eight seconds over the rest of the field. So Wilson is doing a good job there in the number 98 machine. Um, Chris Cable is in second, Mike King in third. So Mike King's now in second, of course, and then Chris Cable in third, Chad Ross in fourth, and then in the late models, it is Brendan Birchhoff from Michi Rossini, Christopher Mark in third, and Gary Mitchell Plowder is in the fourth position. Oh, Brendan Birchhoff's doing a great job on there. Oh, we got number four going off the track, and another, another exchange right there. And that will give the position back there to Cable, so he will regain that second position, which will be official as they come past the line once again. And I think that was just there, you know, the pressure of being behind a car who you know is anywhere between two and four seconds a lap faster than you. Definitely will. It seems like he might uh, have just drove it in too hot, couldn't make the uh, turn going into the first part of the bus stop there and put it in the grass and cut the corner. You know, once you cut the corner, have to slow down and give that time back. And Wilson's lead is now up to 10.876 seconds. And Chad Ross has dropped all the way back through this fifth up there in the number eight machine. Onto the banking comes um, Ross and really has suffered there by that simple off-track incident. So, so, John, tell us, if you're, if you're uh, Leo Wilson, what is your strategy right now, having a 10-second lead on the field this, this early in the time race, how, how are you going to run this? Well, with these cars, I think it's all about maintaining those tires, uh, not getting them heated up too quickly, uh, and just take advantage of this big gap you have, and, and take it easy and turn some laps, and, and hope that your competitors behind you don't start linking up in that draft and, and run you down on the bank part of the racetrack. And Brad, how are we doing in pit road? Oh, we're, d we're doing good down here. Uh, no cars have come in for any major work yet. So uh, just sitting back watching Layla Wilson increase, increase their lead as much as possible. You go and find the buffet car, Brad. Meanwhile, Layla Wilson is still leading away. Um, it looks like Cable is pulling out a nice gap on Kane now. Trying to close down Layla Wilson in that number 98 machine. Who, guys, really has been the dominant force in this um, race so far dominating in practice dominating in qualifying dominating the race yet again can anyone stop leo wilson you know will um as long as layla keeps this lead up hits their marks and stays consistent i don't see anybody really keeping uh being able to cut that almost 11 second gap down have we got a gender verification on layla wilson at this point Oh, and it's like the 38 machine of Chad Ross there, just getting a little bit uh, sideways, just touched the wall in that number 38 machine on the banking coming out of the bus stop's chain. So that is going to really hurt these cars, and especially, guys, as, you know, this car is designed to turn left, and the last thing you want to do is start, you know, altering the balance that already is asymmetrical on these race cars. And Doyle, no, no, we don't know. Okay, great. So I know we're struggling to not say he. Great or reason by <laughs> Little Wilson. And the 38 machine just getting very wide again on the International Horseshoe yet again. And really is struggling now. 
Um, but Wilson in that number 98 machine onto the banking again. Going to put the fifth lap in the book here. Fast lap time for Wilson, a 1 minute 53.370. And in fact, she is coming down into the bus stop chicane. And looks as though she's really got um, breaking points that sorted out. Guys, I just want to give a shout out to the, the lone uh, street stock entry we have in this race, uh, Michael Denton. Even though he's last on track right now, you can tell he's really got his spurs in his horse and he's running some really competitive lap times given that the, the car is just so underpowered compared to his competitors. And yeah, that thing is almost a tank to drive at times. Um, it's so slow to build up the momentum and then, especially in the infield, you know, you get yourself the horse high, you can get yourself up, you make one, two gears, and all of a sudden you've got to come all the way back down again. Oh, somebody just went in the wall, I didn't see it, but I heard it. Um, I'm not quite sure, I think it might be Mike King there, in the number four machine, he blew an engine. Oh, yes, he, he did. blew he an blew engine. engine. did, he's come to uh -huh. a complete stop. There you go, there's some good action for you. Brad, tell us about what's going on there. I believe Mike King has called it a day. His motor has blown and he will be done. He's going to pack that horse up and head home right off in the sunset, cowboy. I have to imagine he was running uh, a, a gear that might have been just a little bit too short. And uh, if you're on the rev limiter up on the bank section of this racetrack, it's really easy to overheat one of those tour mods. Oh yeah, and there, there are ways if you do realize you have put the wrong gear in. Oh, Chris correct. Cable off the off the track. Second P2 is off the track. It's back on now. That was close. Almost got the barrier. And there really are ways that if you are in the modifieds, for example, or in fact, all of the, any of these cars, and you realize that you have put in too short a gear, just put the clutch in. Yes, you are going to lose yourself in a couple of miles an hour, but you, if you can use the banking and use uh, you know, the clutch effectively, you can still coast down, for example, past the start finish line, and you just want to save that engine, and um, at the same time, though, these guys have had, you know, quite a lot of testing here today. Um, not the sort of mistake you'd expect to see from these drivers. No, it's not, Will, but sometimes when a motor's going to blow, a motor's going to blow. Yeah, and there's quite a bit. Looks like he pulled in the pit through his helmet and went right back to the motorhome. He is pretty upset with that. Definitely rode that car hard and put it away wet. So we are about one third distance here at the Daytona International Speedway. You are watching this live on Glacier TV. Leo Wilson is still your race leader for Mike King and Chris Cable. In the modified class, your solitary retirement site is Mike King, who is out of the race, which of course moves Chad Roth up into the third position. And the late model class is Brendan Birchoff from Christopher Mark from Missy Rossini and then Gary Mitch Blouder. Um, and then in the street stock, of course, it is just Michael Denton. He is just plodding along there in that number 44 machine. But he's going to get himself lapped in about um, two laps, I'd say, guys. I think maybe uh, we could take a ride along here. If we could uh, get a Get a lot ride along with the number five car, and then maybe take a, a ride in the camera with uh, Brendan Burkoff, so we could see the difference in the in car between the tour modified and the street stock as go as we go through this, and you know, kind of get an idea of what it's like to be inside those two different cars. Well, the first thing is, and I'm sure that um, one of these guys will be able to elaborate on it. The um, first issue with the modifiers is that you cannot see too much in that race car and even on the oval guys um, it's very difficult to see exactly where those right tires are because it is an asymmetrical seating position and those right hand side tires are a lot wider than people give credit for yeah you're absolutely right will sometimes uh it's really easy to lose somebody who's on your outside on the right side of that car um, just because of the way you sit in these in these cars uh, if somebody's pulling up beside you or you're trying to pass somebody and they do something unexpected, it can get ugly really fast. Yeah, as you're take, taking a look on the inside of the car, it, as we ride along in the passenger seat of, of the number, uh, looks like on the 05 car, you can see, look at the size of the tires. It's an open wheel vehicle, we're having to slow down, you've got the big air cleaner right in your face. Uh, 
and once again, like you said, you just can't see. There's just not a lot of visibility there. And we'll take that back. It is the number 89 machine at the moment. We're having a look at. We are going to try and get on board with one of the modified to the You see that Brandon Birchoff coming down into turn number one. Very, very sideways. These late models are also very tough to control. We haven't talked about it too much in this race, but give credit to these late model drivers, especially as a virtual player, just coming on the exit now of turn number um, five, the International Horseshoe, that double apex right hander. Uh, but that number eight hand machine of virtual is doing a sterling job up front still, and we hope that we will get on board with one of the modified in just a moment. Yeah, no. John or Brad, maybe you want to describe what, uh, what, you, what everybody's seeing there? Since mine was fantasy when I did it. Even though it was fantasy, you did a great job of it. You nailed it to a T. There's a uh, sitting in cockpit. You have a wire mesh in front of your face with uh, what you alluded to, the oversized air cleaner, just about a uh, dead center of the car, off to your right hand side. Obviously, there's one seat and you're encapsulated with sheet metal all around you. You have your A post coming down next to you, which gives you an extremely difficult view to see anything to the side of you and probably a 24 inch space from dash to the top of the car. Yeah, that air cleaner on these road courses too, uh, it makes it really hard to find your apex sometimes. If there's a, a pretty significant blind spot, uh, everything behind that engine sometimes, it's really hard to see. So what's the significance? Why, why is this car built this way with that extremely limited visibility? Is, is it just for safety, but that doesn't that make it worse on the track trying to drive when you really don't have a lot of visibility? Well, most of the time you're only turning left in these cars, so you kind of ignore everything that's off to your right side. And of course, don't forget on the oval you have the benefit of a spotter, which I'm sure these guys have here as well. But of course, the spotter is slightly oh, less minutes. efficient as the number zero Spin out. machine spinning it around there. And yeah. now, yeah, these, these spotters, you know, they still are prevalent on road courses, but not as much as on the ovals. And I think that's almost a saving grace for these modifiers, especially because you just cannot see out the right hand side. And even on the left side, you know, if you, you've still got to be careful because, again, as people forget on their own car, besides those right hand side tires, the same does sometimes apply. To when you're pinching down another driver, you forget the fact that, that, that there is that stagger on the right hand side of the car. Very true. Well, I will say it's a shame to see Chris C Cable uh, spin it there. He was doing, he was riding his horse like a, the Pony Express and was able to take six seconds off of the lead of Layla the last two laps, and he's probably given all that deficit back. Yeah, and he's um, coming down into the bus stop chicane once again. And Cable can still push though. We've still got ourselves plenty of time here just under half an hour in this race and some great onboard shots there with both those drivers we'll try and get one from the helmet position on one of these modifiers at some point later on in this broadcast but cable it looks as though he's got the raw speed but he's just stringing those laps together and i think he did just push a little bit too hard there down into that corner As we take a look at those cars, going back again to the tour modified, if we take a look at, uh, if we can take a look at the number 98 car of uh, Lila Wilson, uh, uh, John, can you describe why the whole car seems to be set to the left? You notice there's more going out, more roll cage. Exactly why is this car built this way? Sure, I can tell you as a native New Englander myself, this style of car uh, really developed in the Northeast. Um, and, and for the most part, you see these cars race on the short bull rings we have up here. And it's uh, just historically speaking, these guys would take their cars out, their Chevys back in the 50s and the 60s, and they would build them to go fast and turn left only. Uh, and that's why you see this asymmetry that by having the right side of the car so pushed out in comparison to the body and, and lining up all the weight as far as you can to the inside of the left, it really helps those cars turn left on the circle tracks. And this really is the NASCAR version of you know, this type of car. Don't forget, you've got um, the Silver Crown, which runs as almost the USAC version, which they use on the uh, starting ladder traditionally, not as much anymore to the Road to Indy, but how do those two cars compare? You know, they've got very similar basic principles, lots of power, put a roll cage around it, but these Waylands, um, they've got themselves a little bit more of a speed advantage if I'm right. 
Brett, looks like we've got some action in the pits. What do we got going on there? Let me go check real quick. I was just eating that cowboy ribeye. Will told me to go get at the buffet table. I believe we have the number 83, Gary Milbacher, pulling in along with the 89 or 99 of Brendan Burkhoff, I believe. Scratch that, it's Misha Rossini. So that is two of the late models, and they are um, both involved in incidents there. So Milbucker um, in the 83 machine has some left-hand side suspension damage. I would say suspension damage, I mean more fender damage there. And it looks as though he is coming back out onto the... No, sorry, it's Machine coming back out on in the number 99 car. In fact, now he's just driven down pit road a little bit, so perhaps he misses pit box had to reignite that car but the 83 car is now back onto the racetrack and that for him is going to be back on and i think when he's put in the point position for that um these guys are going to want to get back out especially the small field we have here today but it really does mean that that number 89 machine of um brendan um, bertroff is just now got a phenomenal lead up front Oh, and even geez. more interesting, even more interesting, Will, he's only 10 seconds behind Chris Cable in that Tour Modified, so even with the deficit in this car, he's really uh, strapped the six guns on and gone after him. Oh, we saw yeah, yeah. yeah, this is absolutely great racing, and Brendan Perkoff being that close to the Tour Modifieds with a huge horsepower advantage. Uh, some great driving by him today, uh, making sure he's keeping that car fast and on, uh, you know, on the prairie. And, we're, of course, we're not racing, you know, you know, all these classes have got, all of these cars race in car class, not um, overall for position. But, um, Doyle, we have seen in the past, you know, in mixed and multi-class series, the cars, the underdogs at a track like Daytona can really use it to their advantage. Um, I think the most famous of it is is in the V8 Cadillac battles that you sometimes see in Glacier TV in the Chalk Week Racing Touring Car Championship that, um, you know, this is the time that the V8 overpowered the Cadillac, which on a normal track you'd never see happen. And whilst in that scenario it was all down to straight line speed, in this scenario it's all down to just how good that late model can be on the infield compared to the, mod um, to the modified. And I really do think it all comes back down to that single gear that the modified really has to utilise on that infield. Definitely. Well, I wanted to let you know the 99 car of uh, Missy Rossini has finally come off pit road and back onto the track at the same time. Gary Milbacher overshot uh, the turn one coming off of the apron and completely had to turn his car around 180 degrees to get back onto the track. Well, thank you very much, Brad. Now you go back to your um, buffet table and get myself a hot dog. Uh, meanwhile, um, let's give a big shout out here once again to Michael Denton in the number 44 machine, plodding his way along in that number 44 street stock car, and he's one lap down, but that was almost to be expected, guys. Yeah. Hey, I mean, Will, look at just let you know, flip the camera to the 98, is off track, came out of the bus stop, got the car uh -oh. loose, overcorrected. And we'll try and get us a replay of that, and we talked about getting onto the banking of the track. It hasn't been too big an issue so far. And it just looked as though it was a little bit of oversteer there. She tried to correct, and it was coming back onto the banking. The car wanted to spear right, corrected it, and then it just spit left onto that grass. And that cost about almost 10 to 15 seconds there. And let's not forget the amount of speed that you're going to have to then spend coming back up um, through the gear. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll yeah. get a chance here. I'd kind of like a. I think we you know we've got Michael Denton in that the lone uh, street stock car. You know, something to take a look at. It's the difference between the late model and the street stock. I mean, there's a complete difference in the way the body's built, the chassis. Um, you know, as far as purpose-built built race cars are concerned, um, as far as that street stock. Um, John, can you tell us a little bit about, uh, um, as far as the street stock is concerned, I mean, obviously it's meant to be closer to stock, obviously it's not stock, 
um, the body is still you know either made out of sheet metal or most some a lot of fiberglass. But what's the difference between the two cars? Um, because they're evenly matched on the horsepower, but actually the chassis are completely different. Sure, that's absolutely right. The uh, street stock is a little bit closer to what you have sitting at parked in your driveway right now. Um, it's meant to be a lower cost series for people to get in, and, and maybe it's their first step in climbing the NASCAR ladder. Uh, the late models are more of a pure race car. They're built from the ground up to do nothing but race. Um, and you see that that might be why they have a little bit of a handling advantage, especially in the infield section of a track like this. And, and John, you never answer since Joe, I see that, it's like 44, struggling there from turn number one and two. You never answered my question there between the, the, the difference in performance from the, um, the modified, which is again the kind of like NASCAR um, version on the road to the Cup Series um, compared to the Silver Crown, which is more on the road to the USAC ladder. Uh, there's, there's actually a pretty sizable difference. If you've ever driven the two cars, especially back to back, um, the, the tour mods are much heavier, uh, they have a similar amount of power, but you can definitely feel the difference in the handling with the much lighter Silver Crown car, or the Sprint cars even. Um, those cars are all about throttle control and all about hanging on and trying to have uh, those beasts around the track, because I can tell you that there's a very big difference in the way the, the cars drive. Yeah, that's yeah. one of the going to talk to Brad a little bit on pit road. If you'll notice that the uh, the two stock cars are actually on pit road for an extended length of time. Uh, Brad, talk to us a little bit about how you change tires and fuel on the late model and street stock as comparison to, say, uh, a cup car or a, a nationwide car. Well, Doyle, personally, I think the difference just comes with the pit crew you have. The uh, fuel flow rate from your gas can into, it, say, a late model or modified is uh, at a lot slower rate than the NASCAR boys run. You know, the uh, they can do a pit stop in 13, 14 seconds, where it takes roughly 30 seconds to change four tires and put the full 22 gallons of fuel into the um, late models. Yeah, and I, and I think yeah. if you'll notice, uh, the, like a cup car, you know, you've got four guys, one on each tire, there's only one bolt, um, but you're looking more on the street stocks than the late models, you're actually, it's more of akin to rolling the jack underneath your car, and you're, like uh, John said, you drive driveway, and pulling the tires off while, you know, guys are running around with five-gallon gas cans. Definitely, you're exactly true. They have maybe two people over the wall with those cars. You've got a jack man and the tire man, and the third, I guess, would be the fuel man. And that all many ways to the fact that you know we've just talked about the street stocks and then afterwards the late models are just there the 44 machine going off track just spinning it around out of the tire barriers good job by him you'll just get it back on track there that is at turn five the international horseshoe and that will allow um, the modified car just, just to breeze past there so the same one from um hassle there as well from there goes to pass into turn number seven once again for wilson but it all comes down to, you know, the speed of the pit stops. You know, these street stocks and, again, the late models a little bit further up, they are normally family-run entries. So, you know, it'll be mom and dad um, doing this or that, some of the kids doing the other little bits, taking the tyres. But when you compare that to, you know, the NASCAR Cup Series, you know, probably the second most efficient pit crews in the world after in the modern Formula 1 crews, um, those guys, you know, spend millions each year on just naming things like pit stops, whereas in the um, small late like models and street stop cars, it's more a case of just driving it because they won't have to, you know, green flag pit stops in the size of their running as often. Yeah, we as we look up front here too, I mean, looking at all the different cars, that later Wilson still <laughs> continues to maintain that. that that massive lead up front, 24 seconds on Chris Cable, um, who was, uh, as we mentioned earlier, actually closing, um, but had incidents of his own. And Little Wilson has actually spun a couple of times, but manages to keep it on the track. So, you know, I haven't noticed a Little Wilson pit yet. Are the tires becoming a factor right now, guys? 
Uh, the tires might be uh, becoming a factor, especially with those spins you saw. Uh, it, it might, you know, with the lead she has at this point, she could probably pit and get four fresh tires and, and maybe pick up some speed for the second half of this race. I will definitely say the number 83 car seems to have overheated their tires to an extreme amount. Coming out of the International Horseshoe, they looped the car once, went, regained it, went about another 200 feet, looped it around again, and then looped it around the following corner. But now it's got the car underneath them and headed on to the banked oval. And yeah, it looks, it looks like Gary Milbacker is uh, struggling a little bit, but back in the saddle again. And for these drivers, I mean, the alternative to pitting, is you just take you know a couple of laps a lot more easy um and it's easier said than done in these cars you know where once you get yourself into a certain power and try and put the power in the car it just wants to snap around on itself and it's almost that whole thing on these cars that you have to really drive it with an amount of speed because cruising about um you get those torque points all completely wrong and you try and put power down and all of a sudden the rear tires want to lead to lead, um, just lights up and spin the car back around on you. But can you save the tyres? Like, you know, just cooling them off for a couple of laps? Is it possible to do that? Or once they fall off the cliff, is it just a case they have to come down pit road? Um, you can certainly back off and, and save them for uh, a little bit. Oh, the 99 hard into the tyre barrier. That is just Michi Rossini, who, a big, big crash, and that was down at the International Horseshoe once again. Just look that, try turning in too much speed on entry into the barrier, and I think his day's gonna be done. He's gonna try and get a tow back to Bit Road, but very crumpled there will be the front, um, front fender for that car. Yeah, and currently we only have two cars in the lead lap. We've got you know, Layla Wilson and Chris Cable, uh, who is trying to uh, decrease the lead that Layla Wilson has, and he's been successful up about nine to 10 seconds so far. Um, of course, Brandon Burkhoff, uh, only one lap down. Uh, very impressive run by uh, uh, Brandon right now uh, in that uh, late model to even be running only a lap down. That's some really impressive uh, driving in a, in a vehicle like that. So hats off to Brandon. I know Doyle, but I'll personally have to say so far my driver of the race would have to be Michael Denton in the lone street stock out there. Only two laps down so far, and we are less than ten minutes away from completion of this great race. And Brad... I wasn't... Yeah, go ahead. Man. I was going to say, Brad, it looks as though uh, Massini's taking that car back to the garage. Um, they're going to try and see if they can get any more repairs to it, or is that car done? I believe... I, I'm sending a telegram out to Mishi right now to find out but I believe they will be done for the day there just seemed to be too much damage to the rear end of that car and it looks like Mitch Blacker as well um, who had issues early on in this race was also done for the day and that leaves Little Wilson still the gap is closing though guys it's down to 15 seconds now between Wilson and Cable so Cable's last lap was a 1 minute 49.384 um, that was pretty much identical to that of Lee Wilson, but Wilson's had some very difficult laps recently. Yeah, I've been watching her uh, make some laps here, and it looks like she does have those tires uh, a little bit too hot. So, we were talking about it earlier, it, it, would, it would be possible for her to back off a little bit, and, you know, maybe take a wider line through some of these corners, and, and just uh, see if she could cool those tires off, and would probably greatly improve her grip in the infield section. And while earlier on, um, Wilson was able to come down pit road perhaps and get out into the race lead. Now that is not an opportunity for that number 98 machine. So it's going to have to be a case of back off and you know just bring this car home now with less than 10 minutes to go. Or if you push it too hard, you know you could lose the race lead after dominating this race. Yeah, and that kind of goes for Chris Cable as well. He's closing that gap down to 13, now it's down to 13 seconds, Will. So he's pushing that car pretty hard. So the question is, is can he maintain that pace to close the gap, or is he going to burn up his car as well, trying to get the job done? So you know, guys, I will say that we've noticed one modified already blow up, and if you can listen, get an in-car sound of Layla Wilson, they're obviously running first gear through the infield portion of this course, which could cause the transmission to blow before this race is over in six minutes. Yeah, I just noticed that speed, it bounced off the level at about 172 miles an hour. Um, so, and 
there's not much that they can put onto this car. I mean, these cars are not designed for running, you know, on the speedway itself, but the straightaways here are very, very long, longer than you see than most of the tracks that these cars are used to. So, I think it might have to come down to that, you know, put the clutch in and post it around the start finish line. And that even throws you off the ground in Kirchhoff. I mean, it is a possibility that, that, that Brandon could be sure winner today if the other two cars push themselves too hard and, you know, end up in a wall or blow the motor. And next thing you know, what do we have? We have a, a uh, uh, you know, one of the other cars, that, you know, stock cars out there uh, winning the race under against all odds. So we're approaching 10 minutes left to go here. And it's... Got 99 spun it, 99 spun it, 98. And that was down into turn... Oh, yeah, a little Wilson off the track mowing the lawn. Yeah, and that was down once again on the International Horseshoe. Here comes Chris Cape, here he comes, making the charge. That is exactly what he wanted to see. Yep, and... Oh, no cable there, just getting a little bit loose. Oh. And it looks like he's struggling there as he got into the draft of the 98 machine and it looks as though that now he's got to put the pressure on the 98 car ahead of him but he's got to be careful himself you see wilson there a little bit loose as they came through turn at number seven this is going to be an interesting because these cars those tires really are just sliding about on both of them they cannot get the power down at the moment and john it looks like for both of these cars their tires are toast yeah, they, they both uh, are probably pushing really hard. I know they're getting to the end of the race. Uh, Layla Wilson knows she's been having some struggles out here, and, and Chris Cable can see the leader now. So they're both going all out, and I'm sure that uh, it's only going to get worse as they get uh, later into this race. The tires are just going to get warmer and warmer and warmer, and these, these guys are really going to have to fight to keep control of these tour modifieds. Hey, guys. Hey, guys. Quick, quick road from... Uh, it road here, Cowboy, but Missy Rossini has repaired their car and is back out on track. The rear end is still completely damaged, so I don't know how the handling will be on the middle infield section of this track so far. Is Missy Rossini, a, is that a multiple person? Is that a team there, car? wasn't sure about that, but you know, take, taking a look up front, too, it's, it's good to see we have another car on the track because I think... Uh, Brendan Burkhoff is starting to get a little lonely out there with Michael Denton. Uh, so it's, it's good to see we have another car on the track with a good pit crew. Ben out to Dents get, get back out there. So into the last 10 minutes, less than 10 minutes, to about eight and a half minutes almost now of the virtual stock car challenge. And I'm doing the 45 minutes of Daytona here on Glacier TV. And um, I have to say though, the, these two, this part for the race league, this is going to go to the flag. And if you can put the pressure on um, in the, from the car of um, Chris Cable, there's still the opportunity to try and make a big move down the inside into the bus stop chicane or play the whole drag race card um, down past the start finish line. So it's not over by any means at all. And the closer that Cable gets to Wilson ahead of him, um, the more that draft is going to become prevalent as they get into banking once again. Yeah, that Texan Chris Cable, it looks like he's on a cattle drive to the front. So, back onto the banking once again there. And it does look as though um, Cable um, loses out a little bit as they get onto the banking. Just have a look at the speed. And Cable there, 175 miles an hour. Very, very close to the buff of the cane there. And I want to get their speed past the line. Because, as I said, Wilson, struggling to get past about 172 miles an hour. We saw Cable there doing 175. Let's look at the banking once again. Cable looking as though he's getting closer and closer. In fact, he's looking as if he might have a look to the high side there as they roll off the banking, down past the start finish line again. Wilson doing 172, 173 miles an hour now, but Cable 178 looking down to the oh, inside. Battle for the out, race out, lead! And they both. Oh. That was close, guys, but. Looks as though that Cable can use that draft to at least pull up to. Had a look down the inside, wasn't quite close enough, but he's very close once again. On to the car, just a little bit there down into the International Horseshoe. And Cable now is on that charge to try and break the dominance of Leonard Wilson ahead. Definitely, yeah, I definitely think it's first Cable. Or... He's galloping to, to the front. It's just unbelievable. And it looks to me like he's 
driving it in a lot deeper and a lot harder on the brakes in, than uh, Layla Wilson. So we're going to see how that plays out here. And Brad, you were just saying a moment ago that? Oh, I was just saying, Chris Cable, uh, he sees payday at the end of this race here. And uh, if he just hit his marks, I believe he can pull the pass off and get himself a new pair of boots at the end of this race. And ladies and gentlemen, I can confirm that Layla Wilson is actually female. Oh, thank you very much. Well, we're, we're really worried about that, so uh, only six minutes left in the race. At least we can confirm that we have been <laughs> speaking correctly. <laughs> okay, Let's look at this uh, Right up on the back of the car. Oh, my goodness. And uh, this is the point. Down into the, uh, into the international hall here. You need to keep the momentum here. Don't get too much like curb use. And it's just on the ragged edge there. Wilson will always have the advantage through this chicane because, you know, she can put down the power earlier and choose her line and Cable behind not only has the aerodynamic disadvantage from the draft but also has the fact that he has to, you know, base his action on the car ahead. As they come past the start finish line once again, if I was Cable, I'd be looking now to the high side trying to breeze around on turn number one. In fact, he's having a look now, trying to see if he can go the long way as Wilson just oh, oh, spins the pass. Oh! Lila Wilson takes a spin. Oh, my goodness. Nice pass by Chris Cable. And it was around the outline. He set the move up, coming down in turn number one. And I think Wilson there thought, well, I've got to take the inside line. And it just didn't work for her because, you know, it's very slippery down there. But if you have a look, unfortunately, we haven't got the Glacier Super Slow-Mo cameras on today. It was just as she hit the double yellow line as she turned in. Looks like the right rear tire just caught that line, and that's what turned her around. And very lucky there not to hit that tire barrier. Yeah, and uh, John, John and Brad, you know, you, you race these cars out here. How unusual is it how, to see a, a, a woman driver out here in this particular type of car? Because uh, she's definitely fast, apparently, on this car, and has done an excellent job of driving today. So, I mean, do you guys encounter a lot of women racers in this particular uh, car? I can't say it's uh, it's the norm, but uh, every every now and then you do see some female drivers come up through the uh, either the SK series or the Tour Mod series. Uh, I'd love to see more. And, and tell me about this. You know, you've watched the entire race now. If it was you behind the wheel of the car, you know, where do you think you would be at this particular point in the race? Well, I hope I wouldn't be in a tire barrier somewhere. <laughs> Honest, in all honesty, I would have already gotten on my horse and rode off into the sunset. And you see Wilson there just getting a little bit of lap traffic past. We are, I believe, about to get the white flag. In fact, we get in the white flag, I believe, this time by. We'll get confirmation of that. Um, in fact, no, we've still got ourselves about three minutes left to go, so we should probably get it next time by. Uh, but Cable is still pushing hard. The gap is now up to... Seven, eight seconds. I believe Wilson's had another incident there. Back down into turn number one. So Wilson, two laps in a row, having the moment there. Um, in, oh, in, and in another, another one, one. in the international horseshoe. And he's got to be careful there. Otherwise, she would collect that late model. Who she's just worked so hard to get past. The late oh, model. She's going to get a penalty for cutting the course right there, too. And so that was a late model. It's Michael Denton in the street stock. So, in many ways, um, Wilson was lucky there that she didn't um, have Lakewood behind her place, so it would have breezed back faster. But after dominating this race, it just looks as though it's either pressure or overusing the tires too much, but Wilson really has oh, those, dropped back. Those tires are just concrete right now. Yeah, yeah it looks like Chris Cable's really re wearing the steps in out front. He's uh, got full control of this car, and he's going to hopefully take this home after getting the white flag. Driving it like he stole it is Chris Cable. Wilson in the second position. This this race result will not demonstrate just how dominant she's been here today. And it is disappointing to see her fall away in the last stages of this race. I mean, at one point, that gap was up to, what, 23, 24 seconds? Yeah, it was, it was really impressive. Uh, she's driven a great race today. Uh, definitely a thoroughbred out there in the field. Uh, it's just unfortunate they, that she chose not to pit and, and, and kept on those tires until they, like I say, they are just 
slick as you can imagine, and that's what really I think has been affecting her in the, later in the race, and that's unfortunate. And it doesn't look as though we've got the white flag this time either, so we've got ourselves two laps left to go here at Daytona, and still anything can happen here. And guys, I mean, normally we expect to see these modifiers, as you said, you know, at a tight short track like Lame Rock, but Daytona really does offer some interesting options because the infield is very much like, you know, the um, like climb rock in many ways. You've got yourself some fast sweeping corners, some very slow technical sections like the first part of the lap at line rock, but then you've got to counteract that for huge amounts of banking and really is posing some challenges for these drivers here today. I have to say I'm really impressed. It takes a lot of work and time and effort just to set up one of these cars to turn right, and uh, it looks like all the drivers in our field today really got a handle on what they needed to do. It's uh, quite impressive. Back onto the banking one again there for the 05 machine of Chris Cable. The gap is about, well, about 18, 19 seconds. Cable building up the speed now as I come, as you come down in towards the buff up chicane for the penultimate time, breaking it down nicely. You don't want to start cutting the course here now. You see the wiggle there in the 05 car as he came through the first part. So very close there to cutting the course. Um, having a look, he doesn't have to take a slow down penalty, but he had all four wheels off the racing line there. And in fact, he did have to take a slow down penalty. You're seeing there, uh, he's, he's only going at about 160 miles an hour. Now he can build the speed back up because he has given up the time required. But then he will now come past, and the white flag is in hand. The time has run out, and Cable is going to win here at Daytona. Yeah, great race by Chris Cable, Layla Wilson, and Brandon Burkoff, who managed to hold off the field and only go one lap down. Uh, and what a great race that Brendan's run. That it, again, congratulations to Chris Cable. So, Leah Wilson takes home the second position. The time ran out, literally, as of coming through turn number three and four. That's why we didn't get to see the white flag. It was out in the fight line for the whole of 15 seconds. Wilson comes home in second. Brendan Birchoff will come home in the third position overall and obviously winning in the team, um, late class. And a big shout out to Michael Denton who came home fourth overall. And obviously, well, he was the only street stock guy, but still, guys, an impressive performance by that number 44 machine. Yeah, and let's not forget uh, uh, Michi Rossini's uh, great pit crew. Uh, you know, Brad called it earlier that that car looked like it was completely damaged and they'd be out of the race today. But that, you know, the pit crew got there, got the hammers out, uh, banged out those fenders and got get the car back on the road. So uh, Michi takes home a really solid fifth place today. And Brad, it looks as though we've just got some information concerning Leia Wilson in relation to why um, she had a loss of performance late on in the race. And I believe um, Brad is back at the buffet table again. Yeah, we can't blame him, but John. Um, um, no, actually, I'm speaking with your crew chief right now, trying to get confirmation on exactly what happened. I do know that she had went off into the dirt and hit some bumps at one point and uh, seemed to have done some, sedam uh, some suspension damage at that point. It was never the same. Thank you very much there. And um, it's after leading for most of this race, I think... One of the things that you can take away from Daytona is that with many of these cars on the iRacing service, you just cannot push them too hard, too fast, for too long. Because if you do, you've got to pay the price later on. And I think that's one of the other things that caught Wilson out there. That's absolutely right. But I want to give a shout-out to Chris Cable. We saw him spin a few times early in the race, but uh, he really reached back into those saddlebags at the end and pulled out the wheel to win and, and beat a dominant car in doing so. And I tell you what, it was a great burnout there by Cable. 115 miles an hour, spinning it on the front straightaway there to do that first donut. Just missed the tire barrier by inches, and this guy practices his donuts. Yeah, so, well, guys, uh, which, which horse are you going to call today as the horse of the race? Personally, myself, I'm going to have to say Michael Denton in the lone street stock out there dug his spurs into the side of that street stock and rode that pony all the way to a great finish to the lone street stock, only three laps down, uh, 22 laps completed for the slowest car out there. 
Brad, I'm going to have to echo uh, your sentiments there. The lone street stock from the Lone Star Estate really had a, a great race today. Yeah, I'm going to counteract you guys and just say, and for me, it was a zero fire machine. Um, I thought he was going to do a police which we lap there. He didn't in the end. But when you consider the fact that uh, Leo Wilson was, what, 25 seconds ahead at one point, it is so easy to just, you know, become disenchanted and do a, the old Mika Hakkinen approach, just giving up. Um, whereas Cable carried on pushing and when Wilson started making mistakes he was able to get into position to capitalise and even though um, Wilson spun, I think that that final spin before he took the race lead was all down to the fact he just lined up the perfect overtaking opportunity down to turn number one. Yeah, for me, I think it, I, I'm still sticking with my man, Brendan Burkoff, who ran a, an excellent race. Only one lap down, managed to keep from getting lapped there at the end. Uh, ran a very good, clean race. Uh, it was quite a while before he took that lap down, but I also have to shout out the uh, top speed challenge uh, you know, for today's race. Actually, probably goes to Brad Sanford for his massive speed going back and forth to the buffet table while we we're doing this broadcast. So that, that was actually pretty impressive. Yeah, and thanks for the hot dog. Um, we're going to run through your final race results. Um, starting first with the Tour Modified, and it was Chris Cable who led the way there. We thought that Leila Wilson was going to take victory, but then it all came unglued for her late on in the race. So Chris Cable with a time of 45 minutes, 4 seconds, 0.218. And that is the reason why, guys, the white flag didn't come out for too long there. It was 4 seconds over. Um, Leila Wilson in second, Chad Ross in third, Mike King in fourth, Joe Malio's in fifth, um, and then Fred Lepone, um, Tal Munterman, and Matthew Katana in the um, late models. And sorry, Katana, don't forget, didn't mention troubles before the start of the race, as Brad ported. In the late models, it is Brendan Bertroff from Missy Wassini, Gary Milchblacher, um, Christopher Mark, and Eric Wood, and then Michael Denton in the street stocks. Um, guys, I have to say, that four seconds, um, had these drivers had to do another lap, as is often the case in time races, it could have been a completely different story, because I've got a feeling that a couple of these cars have, you know, deliberately, and I, I've got a very bad feeling, actually, that one of these drivers was Chris Cable, because you saw how slow he was on that final lap, just making sure he could make it to the line, um, some of these drivers could have run out of fuel. Yeah, it's always a guessing game when you're getting into a timed race like this. You never know exactly how many laps and how many miles you're going to cover. So you could very well be right, right, Will. We are going to try and get ourselves a quick chat with um, your race winner, Will. Um, and in the meantime, Brad, um, biggest story from pit lane today. Biggest story from Pit Lane, in my opinion, has to be the extremely phenomenal pit work of Michi Rossini. That car was completely smashed. It looked like a barroom brawl at your local saloon, but uh, those guys, those English guys, got over the wall. A bunch of 200 mile an hour duct tape and a sledgehammer and got that car back out on track. Yeah, it does look like we're attempting to get. Uh, get our uh, reporters down to the circle there and get some interviews with some of the race drivers today. Uh, if you'll bear with us, uh, hopefully we'll be able to get uh, one or two of them up here and talk to them about the race. And meanwhile, don't forget tomorrow on Glacier TV, the ISOWC um, will be coming to you from Suzuka, um, Suzuka International Circuit. We're in our 22nd round now of the 35 races. Um, um, Brad, especially, I know you've been um, taking a lot of interest in that series. In fact, you've done a couple of races as well. And um, very intense series. And as we're coming to the back end, things are getting very heated now in the championship standings. Yeah, Will, they really are. That is such a great series to run. Um, IndyCar, uh, the Delars, Oval and Road. I would say that... Uh, I believe Dave Jinx is uh, in the lead of that championship at the moment, correct? I believe he is, yes. And um, racing, I mean, full-length races, um, very difficult to just make sure that you can keep yourself going for the entire race. Um, 
And just explain to these drivers just how difficult it is to, you know, keep the concentration for long periods of time. Oh, definitely. I remember running 200 laps in that series at Motegi. It's a great, great race, uh, but it, it's a ton of concentration. And again, I personally want to thank you. That's what got me in that series was your uh, Motegi Challenge road course and uh, the Grand the uh, Grand Prix course and the Oval, the Twin Ring, and it was a great, great event. And Will stepped out trying to see if he can uh, get the technical difficulties ironed out so we can go ahead and get these interviews. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to get uh, your race leader uh, for both the, uh, the, the street stock and the late model and, of course, Chris Cable up here for your tour, tour modified. So uh, bear with us just a, another second here. So, John. Uh, you've spent a lot of time racing a lot of different cars, and currently you, you spend a lot of time in the Indy cars. And and again, you 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 race the uh, Tour Modified on a regular basis. So, what, what would you say is the the biggest challenger, or uh, you know, to getting to be good in that particular type of car? To be good in the Tour Modified, you really need to have uh, a good understanding of mechanical grip when you want to set up the car. And then you need to be good with both feet because you need to use the, the brake and the throttle pretty equally with these cars. And, and the last thing is you really need to understand the way the weight uh, transfers. I, I know that at one point during the race tonight we saw Layla Wilson trying to get up onto the banking and, and get up to speed. And if you're not in full control of the car and aware of what all the weight is doing as you're shifting around, it's really easy to spin the car in a situation like that. Yeah, you know, all of us, I think, uh, at some point in time, uh, while we're coming through the racing and trying to get our uh, different licenses and kind of on that road and, uh, you know, on the trail, as it were, up to the A license that you get, you know, we've all raced the street socks probably or, or um, you know, the late models. I, I personally did not like the street socks as well as I did the late models. But, uh, uh, Brad, did you, which car did you run or which one did you prefer as you were going up through your license levels? Personally, coming up through the license, I fell in love with the Modifieds, the uh, SK. I did get my first win in the late model. However, I won my very first SK race the following week later at uh, Richmond. And the SK doesn't have as much horsepower, so you don't have so much uh, wheel spin coming off the rear end like you do with these Modifieds, the, the Tour Modifieds. The Tour Modifieds, previous to the uh, new tire model that came out uh, about two weeks ago, um, had a lot of what's called uh, right side drive. The torque and power on the rear end of the car is so strong, you would be going down a straightaway, and it was like the chassis would want to twist and put you in the outside wall. And if you can't learn how to navigate that horse and ride it home, the races would end early. And Cowboys, I'd like to bring in the race winner for today. After a performance that uh, we thought was only going to be good enough for second place, um, the determination drive um, really enabled him to capitalize when um, Wilson made that mistake coming down into turn number one. Chris Cable, congratulations on your race victory. Uh, it was a tough, trolled race for you here today. Uh, I'd like to thank you for that. Um, yes, very tough race. Um, the, the wheel spin on those modifieds, wow. That's, that's something else right there. And first of all, just take us through the way you approach the infield, because we've been talking about this quite a bit. Obviously, with only two gears in that car, um, did you were you setting the car up to give you maximum torque in first gear, or were you concentrating more on the oval itself and just kind of like surviving on the infield? Um, it was all a matter of surviving and stuff. Uh, the torque, big, big into that, um, just trying to figure out what the maximum you could get out of it was. Um, the survival, just, it was just hanging on, uh, pretty much giving it the most gas you can, and you can't really turn the wheel too much without it spinning out, which I had happen a couple times there, which I was fortunate enough to get back. Yeah, and that middle part of the race, you're gaining anywhere between two and three seconds lap on Wilson ahead of you, and then that um, down into turn number one, um, on one lap, you know, you just have the door slightly closing you, and then you attempted to make the pass on the outside the following lap, which is where 
Wilson had that moment where she um, got the car onto the double yellow lines and spun the car around. But do you think that had she have not of you know hit those double yellow lines uh, that you would have been able to complete the pass there? Completing the pass? No. I wanted to go to the outside because I knew that she would be hugging that inside line and I knew how I approached turn one as compared to her and I wanted to go to the outside so as to not cause problems or wreck. I was pretty much given her room. I was planning on possibly getting a run though going into the next corner and uh, catching her off guard into that uh, tight turn. And, and then up to the race, and I'm not sure if you had yourself a slowdown penalty on the entrance to the corner, but were you, um, did, would you have had enough fuel to do one extra lap? Because it looks like you wanted that flag to come out there uh, when it did. Uh, I, I had plenty of fuel. Um, whenever I was given the white flag, I had uh, three, possibly even four laps left there. Um, the penalty, I did not get a penalty there on that last lap. I got lucky, although I had time to spare with uh, Wilson dropping back 17 seconds or so. 10-4, and um, looking forward, I mean, you've got yourself a nice wing here, and there's a lot involved in this series, and um, is there anyone you'd like to thank at all? Um, just... Uh, Ran uh, random just looked in the host session, saw this, decided to jump in here. Um, <laughs> honestly, didn't even know this was broadcast until somebody was mentioning it in the uh, on the server here. Um, looking forward though, I'm I might do some more here. It all depends on my work schedule, honestly. Well. Congratulations on your race win in the Modified. I'd like to now bring in um, Brendan Bertroff, who um, got victory in the late model class. And Brendan, it looks as though that you had competition at many parts of this race, but you just able to pull away and keep away from the malaise of messes that was happening around you. Yeah, it was definitely a crazy race. Uh, there was just like, it seemed like where, everywhere I turned for the first 20 laps, it was just carnage everywhere. And it looks like you did have some speed in that late model. Um, in fact, you were able to keep it up with um, Cable for a large portion of that race as he was having issues in that modified machine. But um, what was the grip like in, that, um, in the late model compared to what you'd been seeing on the other cars? Well, it looked like for the street stocks, they were tight the whole race. I don't. That's why I think they didn't have, like, they were not running for the lead or anything. Tour Modifieds looked like they were on dirt at some point. So I think we were kind of the, in the middle. We were c comfortable, but we weren't, like, easy to drive. And it looked as though that those late medals were a lot um, better to navigate the infield. But you're just losing a little. You lost quite a lot of um, performance on the banking. Um, was there any thing that you did though <clears throat> with yourself, um, with your setup, um, to try and get a little bit of a speed advantage on the banking compared to the other cars in your class? Really, to be honest with you, I knew those uh, tour mods were going to destroy me on the banking, so I knew I had to try and maybe tweak it a little better through the turns. Maybe I could get a like catch them a little before they pulled me. Ten four and congratulations on your win in the late models. Fortunately, we haven't been able to get hold of the winner off the street stock, but we'll try our best, um, and we'll do ourselves a, a post race interview. Fortunately, this is now all we have time for today. Thank you very much to everyone who has um, tuned in this evening. You have been watching um, round number two of. Sorry, <laughs> I've got the entire broadcast there and without coughing. You're watching round number two of the Virtual Stock Car Challenge at Daytona. And we will see you all next time. And don't forget the ISOWC tomorrow from Suzuka. Bye-bye. Have a good night, everybody.